so maybe we should start again. Is that all right? So good afternoon again. Uh, thank you for the invitation to present to the ANI Research Workgroup this afternoon on a recent study that I conducted. Uh, I am Dr. Adrian Wald. I'm an associate professor at the School of Nursing and Healthcare Professions at the College of New Rochelle in New York, and. I will give you a little bit of background to introduce my earlier work and my interests. So, uh, as I said, I was in a clinician in oncology back 40 years ago in Boston. My interest in oncology was sparked early on and this experience working with oncology patients fuels my current interest in health promotion and primary prevention, which is what my focus has been for the last 40 years, prevention of cancer and chronic diseases, especially lifestyle and environmentally related illnesses. I was interested in looking at breast cancer patients. Back in 2007, I conducted a study examining interventions for the management of weight and body composition changes in women with breast cancer, which was published in the Clinical Journal of Oncology and Nursing. Again, this focused on lifestyle interventions that would improve outcomes for women with breast cancer. I've also published a book chapter in a public health nursing textbook, Population Health, uh, which focused on physical activity. My research interests continued to follow in the lifestyle and prevention area. Uh, in 2004, I published an article based on my doctoral work uh, in physical activity epidemiology, looking at lifestyle behaviors, especially physical activity, diet, and sleep in a population of undergraduate college students. This was published in the American Journal of Health Promotion in 2014. Uh, my uh, recently, in 2017, I continued my work in physical activity epidemiology uh, with my mentor at Columbia looking at the physical activity vital sign and its use is the reliability and validity of this tool in primary care settings, populations. Um, so it's a little bit of my background just to let you know uh, how I got involved in work in lifestyle and health behavior and health promotion and primary prevention focused on preventing chronic illnesses and really looking at how we can best um, promote health and prevent the suffering that I saw earlier in my career working with in tertiary care with chronic cancer patients. So going forward to tie in uh, some of my other experiences, you can see that I've also been a cross-country coach, a medical tent volunteer, a marathon race director, and an athlete myself. All of this um, coincided with my interest in physical activity research, especially uh, working with the American College of Sports Medicine. I'm an active member of the organization, uh, especially their Exercise of Medicine initiative. And most recently, I've been involved with the American College of Sports Medicine, uh, working on a project team reviewing data on exertional heat stroke for a, an update to an American College of Sports Medicine position paper um, on extreme heat stroke and heat-related illness, which led me to my current interest uh, going even more uh, focused on heat-related illnesses in other populations and focusing on um, the study that I'm going to be discussing with you now today that was recently published um, in January of this year in a special issue on climate change and health-related environmental risks uh, by nursing economics. So this study that I'm discussing is uh, 
an integrative review. It's based on the Whitmore and Kamal's methodology. Um, and the, the study purpose is, as you can see on this slide, is really to identify and synthesize the literature as part of this integrative review um, over a 10 year period, approximately from January 2008 to 2018, looking for evidence on the impact of heat related illnesses due to heat waves or extreme heat events um, in the United States related to emergency department visit rates um, and as they present in this often in this frontline setting of the emergency room. So that's the overall purpose of the study. Uh, I'll get into the methodology and some of the findings, but first just um, a little bit of background. Uh, it's well known that extreme heat events threaten public health and impact our healthcare delivery system. Uh, utilization across the healthcare spectrum. While um, extreme heat events have occurred historically, as the slide shows, their frequency, their duration, and their severity and intensity have recently um, increased significantly. Um, this show is data from the IPCC 2018 um, showing that these have massively increased. And of course, we see coverage of this, these events in the news every day. Uh, most recently, uh, this month in India, we saw temperatures reaching 123 degrees Fahrenheit um, in a deadly heat wave in India. And just this week, actually yesterday in Europe, uh, there was a, another heat wave event in Germany, we see that even the um, temperature reaching 101 degrees Fahrenheit and we see buckling of the Audubon and the need to uh, reduce speed limits as a result of the impact on the roadways and transportation system. Um, we also see um, that Europe all over Europe this week is bracing for record setting heat waves um, up to 113 degrees in parts of Europe. And you can see in France, uh, the conditions are quite dire with people uh, canceling schools, uh, the temperatures record setting in the 90s and hundreds when the average high historically in Paris has been in the low 70s. So this is the setting that we are in today in terms of extreme heat events. Uh, globally, so this is a global issue for public health and for the healthcare system. Globally, this is just a small sample of some of the impact that we see. This is uh, in India in 1998, Europe in 2003. We saw 55,000 deaths in Russia. And this is just mortality related to heat wave disasters, which is not even the focus of, of my work, um, but gives some context because the, most of the, the data that we have is on mortality. And now if we start to focus a little bit more on extreme heat in the United States, we see that a, in terms of all of the major weather related deaths, the leading cause is extreme heat with 24% uh, of deaths in the United States from 2000 to 2009 attributed to heat, extreme heat events. Uh, this compares with hurricanes, which are next, uh, which are attributed to 23% and floods, just 13%, tornadoes, 11%. Often um, these other extreme heat event deaths receive more attention in the media and uh, in the, the public health world, they're much more dramatic um, and have high cost of effects in terms of devastation and other kinds of damage other than just mortality. And so we can see here from the fourth, again, going to the fourth national climate assessment, we see that extreme temperatures have become more frequent. Uh, recently from 2001 to 2012, we see twice as many uh, records in the United States 
uh, set for high temperatures as compared to low temperatures. So now, uh, turning to the United States, we see that in the um, upper graph, we see that heat wave frequency as well as at the bottom, the uh, heat wave season length is also increasing in the United States uh, over the last uh, time period, 25 year time period. And again, the mortality due to specifically heat related illnesses in the United States um, has been demonstrated to be about 620 people a year during the time period from 1999 to 2010 from heat related illnesses. This again is mortality. And this, um, I don't know if you can see the small figure, which I'll discuss a little bit further, uh, shows some of the impacts, the spectrum of heat related illnesses and how they progress um, to end in the mortality that occurs mostly from heat stroke and the, the deaths occurring uh, in vulnerable populations such as children, the elderly, and the poor predominantly. Uh, as we move forward, we also see that um, not only are the average number of, of heat waves and the heat waves, uh, the, the season of heat waves is extending. We used to not see these kinds of heat events in June. We would see them in July and August. Now we see the, the season extending from May to September. Um, and we're also seeing that um, these heat waves and, and the hot days and high humidity is also persisting and to prolonged um, elevation of nighttime temperatures, which are also an important um, factor in causing heat related illness and the mortality that relates to that. So this all then um, informs some of the background as we started to look at the specific study that I conducted um, reviewing what we know now about uh, look, looking at uh, the literature in the last 10 years on specifically emergency department visits, morbidity as opposed now to mortality for heat related illnesses due to high ambient temperatures, heat wave events, or heat waves. I'll talk a little bit more about these definitions in just a couple of minutes. Uh, so to be eligible to be included uh, as a study, you, the study must have been published in English and must have focused on these on outcomes of heat related um, illnesses uh, that resulted in emergency department visits as an outcome measure. And again, they had to be in the United States. Uh, much of the, the data that was excluded as part of the study was for uh, many more studies that have been conducted outside of the United States. So we specifically excluded studies that did not have high temperature or heat wave events as the primary exposure and studies that did not uh, quantify emergency department utilization or costs as outcome measures. So why? Um, why are we focusing on the emergency department? Uh, the spectrum of, of heat related illnesses, which range, uh, as we'll see in a few minutes, from relatively mild heat cramps uh, to life threatening heat stroke, or to, have been the primary environmental cause of, of heat related injuries, of weather related injuries in the United States emergency departments lately um, from 2001 to 2004. We know that the emergency department is a frequent access point um, in the healthcare delivery system. And in particular, this is true for vulnerable populations and the emergency room is considered to be a major component of the healthcare system in the United States. Uh, it's also a very expensive um, setting to receive care. So as acute demand during extreme uh, heat events uh, presents considerable challenges and it has now become a growing area of concern for the healthcare system, especially uh, the emergency department. So now we need to um, understand some of the definitions that are 
uh, relevant to the study. Um, when we talk about high temperatures and heat wave definitions, they are similar um, and they're related terms, but they are not synonymous. So when we talk about heat waves, we are generally understanding these to be acute periods of extreme warmth. Um, however, to complicate matters, there is no single standard definition of a heat wave. Um, there are, though, some diversity of definitions that are used, and the definitions uh, differ based on a couple of different things. They vary in terms of the metric of heat that's used. Some use daily uh, mean temperature, daily uh, maximum temperature, a combination heat index of temperature and humidity, uh, the parent temperature. These are all different metrics that are reported in the literature uh, related to uh, heat metrics. Uh, the threshold for exceedance used in the definition of, of a heat wave is also variable. It can be an absolute threshold of a certain temperature that is reached or it can be a relative threshold relative to the uh, usual conditions. Um, and in addition, the duration of the heat waves, uh, of the heat, extreme heat is also variable in the literature from being a day to uh, multiple length um, criteria. So these are some of the uh, definitions we see, and we see that in terms of risk factors for heat-related illness, these are mostly based on the data for mortality, which um, is relatively uh, an interesting area in that the heat-related illnesses, uh, mortality is not well tracked. The data comes mostly from death certificates. And these, this data uh, is often found to be underreported. But this is what we know in terms of risk factors for heat-related illnesses, um, and these are listed on the slide. Um, my work in athletes focused mostly on, and our understanding of um, heat stroke comes often from the literature in the military and athletes on exertional heat stroke. This is a slide that just shows, I don't know why it's jumped, but it just uh, shows some of the characteristics and the difference between classical heat stroke and exertional heat stroke, both of which we see um, during extreme heat events. So this is something you can, we can look at a little later. Uh, in terms of other definitions related to the work in heat waves, uh, we want to understand what uh, different definitions of heat waves are. So going back to 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine, we see some of the definitions uh, of heat waves being three or more consecutive days during which the air temperature is 89, almost 90 degrees Fahrenheit or greater. Uh, you can see that even since then, those, these temperatures have continued to uh, to rise uh, in terms of thresholds that we're seeing these days, uh, changing some of these definitions. So we have these earlier definitions of, of heat stroke that have pretty much um, remained in effect. You can go ahead, um, going to some current definitions of heat illness, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. And again, uh, this is a progression of illnesses that we see. Uh, beginning with the relatively um, uh, common heat illnesses that um, can affect anyone. So no one is immune from uh, uh, heat-related illnesses. And one of the, the um, areas of concern is, of course, that they, there's not a great understanding of how they progress uh, across the spectrum that this next slide shows of the severity of effects. So we see the spectrum of heat illnesses that begins with um, heat edema, heat rash, uh, heat cramps, dizziness, et cetera, and all the associated symptoms of, of heat illnesses that we're familiar with, and then progress um, for 
somewhat unknown reasons um, into neurologic complications and um, these more severe uh, heat stroke conditions which become um, uh, medical emergencies. So going back to the study, what we focused on was searching two uh, major databases, CINAHL as well as PubMed databases. Again, we focused on the time period from January 2008 to 2018 as the uh, topics uh, to, to just ensure timeliness. And the search terms that we use were rather broad, um, kind of cast a, a wide net looking at extreme heat event or heat wave, morbidity, emergency room, emergency department, cost, economic burden, to try to identify the studies that were relevant um, to this topic. So this shows the uh, methodology used for the search results, and again, identification using the two databases. We removed duplicates and did the screening. Uh, you can see that many of the initial screening uh, did not uh, remove the non-US studies that, we, that was done um, manually, uh, reviewing all of the studies uh, for eligibility, resulting finally with um, a, an inclusion of 17 studies that were found to be relevant. So again, um, the overview of our results. Uh, after uh, what we found was, uh, in terms of these 17 studies, uh, most of these were conducted within the last five years within that 10-year review period, which I think reflects uh, growing interest and attention to this topic. Uh, while we know more about mortality, there's a interest now on morbidity and understanding uh, the impact of utilization in um, various settings. So these 17 studies, uh, can we go back for one second? The, uh, most of them, uh, again, were utilization in, that covered a range of temperature events and locations and the diverse geographic patterns, uh, diverse geographic areas of the United States that were reported on, which I'll get into in, in just a minute. So we find um, mixed, re mixed results in terms of reporting on various subpopulations as well. So some studies reported um, further breakdown of data um, on age and gender, as well as findings related to urbanization and rural patterns, as well as occupational or recreational patterns, um, and looked at the per, uh, type of heat-related illness that was examined. So if we go ahead now and look at these 17 um, studies in the article, this is just a screenshot of the uh, organization of the synthesis of the data, which is part of the methodology for an integrated review, is to organize the data um, according to predetermined categories um, that were collected, and each study was then reviewed uh, to determine uh, the to, to synthesize the data in a, in a way that was meaningful. So we looked at um, some of the geographic locations that were covered in these studies. Uh, in the Northeast, there was a study in North Carolina and uh, New York City. The Southeast, Florida, Virginia, Georgia, and then a regional study of, of Southeastern states. We had studies that took place in, in the Texas heat wave um, and the California heat wave of 2006 that was uh, quite widely studied. And then we have some other data, of, um, other studies that were identified in, that looked at a more national or regional um, database. The population study were mostly the adult population. There was a single study that looked at um, emergency department visit utilization in children. So to summarize, uh, 
we did find some empirical data that shows excess um, emergency department utilization related to various variously defined heat wave conditions or events, uh, regions and populations affected um, have variable patterns of health-related um, emergency room visit rates. Uh, to the data, the studies that we identified were mainly descriptive in, in nature. Uh, the variable impact on rates was reported uh, based on, again, the climbing, the, the general climate of the region, the duration and the timing of the temperature increases and population characteristics. So it's difficult to make comparisons across studies and our initial findings do suggest the need for more standard and consistent measures uh, if, to, uh, across studies. Uh, initial cost data is scant. The, there was data to, um, uh, from the 2006 California event, which um, has some cost data, which I think is on one of these next slides. No? Okay. Uh, I'm not quite sure what happened to the slide. But The limitations of the study, uh, this was a single author reviewing the protocol and studies, so certainly there's a possibility of selection bias. We only searched two databases, making it uh, possible that there were studies that were um, uh, unintentionally omitted from other databases. Uh, it may be that the applicable search terms were not um, as um, complete as we would have liked. We may have been missing search terms. Um, I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. So, again, what we do show, though, is that there's data. I seem to be missing a few slides, but there seems uh, heat. What we know from this initial review of data. Uh, studies related to emergency department utilization and cost implications. The, the slide that I don't see is related to the 2006 um, heat wave in California, in which out of a $5.3 billion event for that heat wave, which in the $5.3 billion were identified, um, included all of the costs associated with um, the event. The heat, the health specific impact was then found to, to be uh, $5.3 billion, um, of which 14110 million million was specifically related to heat related illnesses presenting in the emergency room. So that fuller $5.3 billion figure related to mortality and um, morbidity across the healthcare spectrum, not just in the emergency room. So this was really the only data that was available on some of the cost implications of these events. Uh, but we know that in periods of high demand, providing access to the emergency departments may going forward be increasingly challenging. Healthcare system resources and the economic burden from uh, extreme heat events is only projected to increase. There was one study in the review that actually provided um, future scenarios using RCP 4.5 and 8.5 projections that demonstrated um, that the costs associated with these events in 2015 with 4.5 versus 2090 um, would continue to uh, prove to, to uh, be a, an economic burden uh, and specifically place strain on emergency department resources. So planning uh, a proactive approach across the healthcare system, working again with the preclinical setting 
uh, where many of these illnesses begin in the early stages before progressing across the, the spectrum of illness. Um, the focus on prevention can help and a coordinated um, approach of public health and clinicians and the clinical care environment uh, will be necessary going forward as we continue to cope with um, the climate change related impact on these events. So uh, I just wanted to thank especially my mentor at Columbia, Dr. Carol Garber, who is, um, has helped enormously in, in furthering my research interests and career. And uh, I'm always indebted, most importantly, to my students who challenge me every day and keep me uh, stimulated and uh, energized. So I'm glad to entertain. I'm sorry about some of the glitches in the beginning, uh, but I hope that I've been able to present uh, at least an initial overview of the research that was done in this study. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Adrian, this is Katie. Thanks so much. That was really interesting. Well, I'm sorry about the glitches in the beginning there, um, but I hope that this was informative. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more activity in this area, and I'm excited to continue to try to quantify the morbidity related to um, heat waves and extreme heat events, which is really a kind of a new area to cost, affect cost analysis is going to become incredibly important as we start to plan resources and deploy them effectively to address um, the demand that's going to be placed on our healthcare system. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much. This is Adrian. I apologize for the... Go ahead. Go ahead. I think I couldn't hear you too well. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, just wanted to apologize for the beginning. I don't know what has happened with my computer, but anyway, I enjoyed your presentation oh, I understand. so much. I enjoyed yeah. it so much. I hope that you keep on doing. It's great work, and then come back and give us another presentation for what you have done again. All right. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, and I look forward to uh, speaking again soon. Thank you. Adrian, this is Jessica Kastner. Thank you again for this, this wonderful presentation. What's next for you as a scholar now that you've completed this review? What's your next project looking at? Uh, that's a great question. I've been exploring some collaborations going forward uh, with people at, at Columbia and in New York City who are looking at uh, trying to do a better job quantifying this cost effectiveness area. And it's a difficult area to uh, kind of wrap around because Heat-related illnesses, you, you probably know the, these are only the direct costs that we're talking about in, in this research. So I'd like to expand also beyond the direct heat-related illnesses uh, to things like the exacerbation of underlying conditions. We know, of course, that we see an increase in cardiovascular disease and pulmonary disease uh, presenting in the emergency room as well with heat-related events, uh, and there's not a lot of work looking at, at quantifying those as well as on kidney diseases, et, et cetera. So trying to get a, a, a greater handle on what all the costs are and uh, how, they're, how the data is collected, what the databases are that are available. Um, even the, the mortality data is not well 
um, quantify. We don't, there's no requirement that I'm aware of that requires uh, reporting heat related deaths. So I know that there's work in that area. Uh, so I'm hoping to continue to look um, more deeply at uh, how we can look, understand this regionally as well as at local community level because we were going to see different patterns. Uh, we also, there's a lot of work that could be done in terms of working with the occupational health area uh, of different subpopulations of, of athletes and, and occupational health. We, the, the understanding the patterns that I do start to look at, I didn't have a chance to get into today, but the patterns of um, the age groups that are affected, and there's, a, there's mixed results in the data, the literature that I reviewed in terms of whether it's pretty consistent that males are more effective than females, and uh, certain, but there's discrepancies regionally in terms of um, the occupational versus recreational spikes. And so we see regional and geographic differences as well as the heat wave characteristics themselves that impact these factors. So there's a lot of work to be done in this area. And, uh, but I, I think get also that the, the work in understanding the costs related to these are going to be really needed to inform uh, the uh, resource deployment and the preventative measures that are put in place to try to reduce uh, the utilization and to best um, manage the treatment across the healthcare spectrum. So thank you so much for that question. I hope I've. No, that's that's excellent. And just to bring to your attention an opportunity that struck me and that relates to some work of other ANI affiliates relates to the slide that's currently up with this diversity of definitions. And that's the opportunity to do a concept analysis of heat exposure. And uh, Marcy Thompson's presented to our group on the concept of exposure and the essential elements, but really that's, mm -hmm. that's very focused on an agent, like a chemical agent. So how much clarity would it bring to all of us to have a concept analysis and really a clear operational or standardized operational definition that you might recommend as a scholar as to what heat exposure could and should be? Um, that would certainly deepen the scholarly literature, uh, but what, mm -hmm. a, what a fantastic idea and how relevant to look at costs. I know in some of the emergency department utilization literature when you're talking about uh, a disaster or you're talking about, especially with older adults who tend to be a higher percentage of who utilizes the emergency department, there's often what's called a harvesting effect. And that is yes. you'll take what might be six months of utilization or three months of utilization and during a heat wave, you'll see that sort of compressed because of that external exposure, but then it evens out over time. So you'll actually, after the heat wave's done, you'll have less utilization in a follow-up period. Did you come across that or how will you incorporate that in your, in your uh, scholarship going forward? Well, the, that is a great question and it's something that did come up um, as part of, of my review. The, the question of um, the timing of these events and when we see a lag in response, we see a spike. And again, it's really variable across settings and time frames. We can see like in August, uh, with unacclimated football players, athletes, that there'll be an increase in heat-related uh, um, illnesses uh, within certain uh, time windows, and then we'll see delays in other populations where uh, with children, there was the one study by Sheffield in New York City of, of children zero to four, looking at, um, at this more of a delayed effect in children, where the first day or so, they with the heat, the elevated heat event, they will not, they don't have a response, but they'll see it. There's a lag effect, 
So there's a lot of variation in terms of that. And again, that's something that needs to be further examined. Uh, and there's also some interesting work, um, interesting mixed results that I found in terms of in the occupational health area. We'll see that uh, in, we know the urban island effect, but we, in some of the studies, there's a higher incidence in the rural areas compared to the urban areas. And that again, may, and those are in younger populations, and again, it may just be it's related to other factors such as occupational um, work and um, those kinds of, of settings. So we see then again, we will see younger populations presenting in the emergency room. We'll see uh, more of the day laborers, the migrant um, workers, et cetera, who are, you know, may be acclimated to the heat, but then there's a lag effect as they're day after day after day subjected to longer heat wave periods uh, will then um, present. So there's certainly um, a lot of areas that can be looked at more closely. And, if, if, and we do see mixed results in terms of age groups as well. So you know, the elderly, as you know, have been well studied. They're the, the most studied. They're thought to be the, the most vulnerable group. Uh, well, but there's also these pockets of young adults, 19, I believe it was the 19 to 27 year old age group, where we see increases, and again, occupationally related or um, athlete exertional related. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work. And in, in terms of working with the disaster community, um, there's certainly so much opportunity for planning and looking at the preclinical care and management and health heat warnings. Um, and again, the consistency across systems of you know, what's a, what is a heat warning in one location um, is not the same as a heat warning in another location because they're, they're dependent on uh, local factors. So if there's, if, if there's a southeast high humidity region, high heat region that's acclimated, perhaps the heat warning system is different than in other areas. So I think I've taken up enough time. Are there any other questions? No. Jessica, before you end the meeting, I would like to welcome our new co-chair, uh, Dr. Luz huntington Muscat. I think that she had some technical issues last time and she couldn't introduce herself. I would like for us to give her a few moments so that she can introduce herself. Luz? Hi, Azita. This Hi. is Luz huntington Moskis, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Louisville. I was in my PhD program with Azita, and I've been working closely with um, Jessica as well in recent publications. So I'm very eager to um, work with them and, and continue the great tradition that they have of really keeping this group active. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If there is not any more questions, then we just end the meeting. No. And again, I so, all right, and be careful out there in the heat. Yeah, thank you. You too. Bye, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Jessica. Bye -bye. Thank you all.